Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. We are back in the Anzio Beachhead, and we are looking at the first special service force, the Black Devils. Our guest is World War II TV channel regular Brad from OTD Military History. The links to his channel, if you don't know it already, are in the description below. I'll bring Brad in now. Good afternoon, sir. How are you today? Doing well. Thanks for having me on again, Woody. Really appreciate it. And a chance to talk about, I think, as you said, my first non-fully not exclusive it. Canadian show. Yeah, with us. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting force and one I'm I'm interested to talk about in this format especially because it gives us a little bit of free willing freedom, as I like to say on my own channel. So indeed, and we'll do questions and stuff. And just a, a, a question to start it all off. It is one of those units that has been given the kind of the Hollywood treatment. There are some yeah. lots of books. There's does that help or hinder in terms of getting down to the details? Do the it's a <laughs> unit that people think they know about? Uh, well, well, I knew this was going to come up, but the movie, I've never seen the movie, only pieces, ah. and, um, purposefully, especially recently, um, especially, um, said this to you before we started, but I did a video a while back on, on Canada and Britain, uh, sorry, Canada, US, basically financing, helping Britain, particularly early in the war. So I did some quick Canadian US cooperation, things like this and the Manhattan Project and some other economic stuff so people are like do the force do the force do the force in the comments so i was like all right let, let's do it so especially since then i've been not looking at anything to do <laughs> with the movie because i know it's awful and it's and the famous scene of the canadians coming in after the americans are brawling with each other it's it's not like that at all so it, it, i think it hurts in a way um but I'll say a good chunk of the books i've been looking at are, are not great and it just it's not necessarily bad in the the focus like the one i have is like primary accounts or interviews and it's just it's missing the vital context of things or you have the other side where there's nothing and it's just boom 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 mm. boom boom so to me it's it seems to be i don't know not necessarily waning because it's obviously extremely popular but like you said the details are heavily mythologized and uh that's a very polite way you've done this before brad you're being very very <laughs> Careful with your language. I just yeah, think it's, it's going off. It's, Years it's, ago. Not, it's not what people think it is a lot. Uh, and that's why I wanted to look at Anzio specifically. The book I bought years ago online was this one here. Um, yeah, I didn't even look at that one. Um, and I was so pleased to get it because when it came in the post, I had no idea it was going to have this. It's signed yeah. by loads and loads of veterans because it was it was up at one of the reunions up in um, uh, Montana. Yeah, um, right. So I got it. it. Was like I don't care how good the book is. It's signed by <laughs> yeah. a veteran. So it, I don't yeah. even know I've ever read it cover to cover. It just it just sits there with all those signatures of these guys who served in there. Mostly the American guys, but yeah. Anyway, that's my yeah. showing off there. But we'll bring up your PowerPoint, folks. We'll do questions as we go along. Um, and you know we're continuing this general idea of the beachhead and and the defense of it. And we talked about it with Alex on Monday. Lots of different units involved from lots of different nations, and this was just one of them. But over to you, Brad. Yeah, so obviously looking at the first Special Service Force, I'm probably not going to call it by the nickname. Um, trying not to. <laughs> For a reason we'll get into, um, kind of, sort of. Um, I just call it the Force because I've been working on a video on myself. So I've been trying to call it the Force because this is obviously a mouthful. But that's the thing I want to talk about. So what we're going to be looking at is, uh, sorry, one second here. Um, sorry, I want to say from my own perspective here of how I'm looking at it. Um, so people don't get upset that I didn't talk about the thing they want to talk about. They'll get upset about that anyway. But obviously coming as a Canadian military historian, and, and that's largely my focus, right, is another chip on the Canadian shoulder is why weren't the Canadians part of the push on Rome itself, right? It's safe to have, quote unquote, earned that with things like Ortona and, and, and the gully and moving across and all that stuff. So that's where I started with this was looking at the Canadian official history about the Canadians in Italy, the great book by Nicholson. And that's the frame that he took. It's about all these things leading to Rome. Obviously, the all roads lead to Rome is a famous phrase. So mm -hmm. that's how I wanted to kind of look at this is, is maybe a Canadian perspective. It's got this chip on the shoulder element to it. And that's a lot of the scholarship is by Canadians. So it takes a Canadian bent. And I was using mostly Canadian sources, which is also an interesting thing, a way of looking at it. But that's kind of what I'm going to be using as my sort of focus and uh, as we move forward here. So a quick background of what I want to talk about is obviously the bridgehead. 
Uh, and then the push to Rome itself, which is obviously connected to this story. Um, again, due to all kinds of limits, mostly time and, and accessibility, um, didn't get as many primary sources as I would have liked. Um, it, it's mostly Canadian. Unfortunately, again, I couldn't get too much American because um, that I just couldn't find anything good or that I could really verify in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so it's just a few recollections. So it's mostly official documents. Uh, um, the U.S. Army produced book, uh, war diaries, uh, things of that nature. Uh, there's a source list at the end. Um, cool. So it'll be kind of a top-down look. I'm not trying to do the nitty-gritty, not trying to explain all of Anzio because we would be here forever. Um, just because there's so much going on. And, you know, as Alex talked about was that the other day, um, there's just a lot going on here and, and trying to do all of that is, is nearly impossible. So, I, I, and also you had a show, I can't remember a while ago now, uh, about the first special service force and how they were started and all of that. So I don't want to go into that at all, really, because um, there's just too much going on uh, with that. Uh, but I do want to do a couple things that uh, just to set the scene really quickly. Um, so as we know, the first special service force is a joint Canadian U.S. unit. Uh, the majority of the troops are Canadian or American. Sorry, it's not quite 50-50. Um, those numbers obviously fluctuate for all kinds of reasons, uh, but they're overall commanded by an American, uh, Robert Frederick, uh, who you talked about on the show, and then and his abilities to do admin, but also this dashing type commando thing, which is a great way of looking at this. Uh, but this force is envisioned to do things that your typical, say, infantry division cannot do. Um, things like parachuting into difficult conditions, mountain warfare, um, amphibious assault, assaults and like rubber boats and things like that they were preparing for. And their war diary of the training is just is absolutely wild. Um, so that was what was envisioned. Uh, one of the arguments that I do make, though, is that's not quite ever really what happens, right? They don't ever make any combat jumps. And, and we'll talk about some other stuff later. But it's it just doesn't seem to fit that, you know, this definition and that reputation that they had. And no fault of their own. It's just how they were used. Uh, so real brief, uh, it's three 600-man regiments with two battalions each, a headquarters. And then uh, depending on which country you look at, the terminology is different, which is fun for me as a Canadian historian and jumping back and forth between American and the British lexicon, uh, the base echelon or a service battalion. And that's what really sets them apart is that, that service battalion built into the force. So again, I don't want to talk about the Canadian, you know, in and out of all this stuff, but just some of the naming conventions is quite interesting because what do you call this from a Canadian perspective? Change names multiple times. The most interesting one is the second Canadian parachute battalion, even though all the Canadians aren't serving in one battalion within the force, as we know it from the Canadian perspective. But it's all over the place. So the number of Canadians fluctuates between six and 800 is a rough estimate. Um, so that's almost a one third of the fighting strength. Whereas the base echelon is all Americans. So Canadians are at the front and five of the six battalions are led by Canadians. Uh, and for those not familiar, this is organized obviously on US Army lines, technically under US Army command. So they are earmarked for fighting in the Mediterranean at the, seemingly ironically, Quebec Conference in October 1943. They are given that sort of role of this is what they're going to do. And this is coming after Kiska goes basically nowhere, <laughs> right? They go to Kiska and, and, and don't do anything because there's nobody to fight. So they leave rather quickly. Uh, so they're sent to uh, Naples where they join in uh, U.S. Fifth Army under our, everyone's favorite on this channel, especially Mark Clark, uh, who at the time, and you can see a quick map here of uh, La Defensa, which is their, probably one of their best known actions, particularly before Anzio, uh, which again, unfortunately don't have time to talk about that today. It's a whole confusing, crazy story on its own. Uh, so that takes place in December uh, with La Defensa first, and then now uh, to Mayo in uh, January 44. So after that, they are moved to the bridgehead. Um, and just, yeah, real quick, um, there's lots of stuff on these actions you can find online. Um, but also what I wanted to talk about real quickly here is this, they call it the six weeks of action while they're fighting their way through December into the new year. Uh, 
they take a lot of casualties. Um, like frostbite and exposure has a huge impact on here because, as I like to say in the comment bars, anytime Italy comes up, right, it's all it's all mountains and rivers. It's difficult terrain, and it's one of the coldest winters in European history. Um, that whole time period of the war seems to be particularly cold, so these things cause casualties along with the Germans. So when they're getting moved to Anzio, they're under strength. Um, this is in part because of uh, the casualties taken in uh, the parts attacking the winter line, uh, but government policies as well from the Canadian government. The initial policy is not to reinforce this at all, right? They, they come from this plan of, you know, Project Plow and the stuff through Norway and all this other stuff that is on your other show. Um, so there's no plan to, to bring in reinforcements for that. Obviously, Anzio changes that as it did for so many other things. So that's kind of setting the scene of where they move in to the bridgehead here. So this is just a map of those two actions. Uh, I need some water, so take a second here. You can see the movement here, and this is from the Canadian official history, which I contend has some of the best maps ever made for the war. And they're all public domain, so you, anybody can use them. So this is great. You want to check those out. It's uh, available online to read if you want to read about those actions. So Anzio, this is from that U.S. Um, Army book I talked about from their historical section about Anzio all over the whole battle. Uh, they have stuff on the special uh, service force. So again, uh, I said they weren't reinforced in between, you know, leaving that fight for the winter line and coming into Anzio. Uh, they come into Anzio on the 1st of uh, February, 1944, anniversary coming up shortly, uh, as part of Sixth Corps. Um, they come in there, obviously, the had happened on the 22nd of January. So they're not coming in, you know, fresh onto the beaches here. But as was talked about with Alex, Alex Kershaw the other day, it's constant fighting every part of this bridgehead. It's under constant observation, constant artillery that comes up almost every day, I think, uh, in the war diary is they're under fire. Um, and we'll get a bit of that as well. But it's uh, it, it's really interesting reading to see that and how they're, they just kind of slot into the line here at Anzio. And, and that's one of my arguments of why they aren't used, being used properly, being used as a frontline unit like this when they shouldn't be. Um, so they actually relieve combat engineers on the front, which is really, really interesting. Again, showing how Anzio has changed so many things. Um, and this is said to be a, a quiet sector of the front. Um, there's tons of great maps and stuff that I was able to find, this being one of them. Uh, Ooh, good one. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, yes, yeah, so this is said to be the quiet sector. But as one of the things I'll be saying in my own video coming up, hopefully shortly, I finish it, is uh, it, it didn't stay quiet because of the force uh, for all kinds of reasons. So, so this is uh, maps that I've lifted from the War Diary, um, you, you know, your standard 1 to 50,000 and 1 to 25, uh, with traces. And this is something I noticed for their War Diary overall. It's full of traces, which I, you don't see, right? Like, you don't get to see that as much as you'd like. So this is kind of the basis of my video. You can see where it says event. Uh, those are some things I'll be talking about in my own video and briefly here. But that to me, I don't know, as the history nerd that I am, uh, I was like, yeah, all right, we got these traces, we got these notes that are oftentimes, well, missing from the Canadian War Diaries. So so having these details is is fantastic. So this is uh, the same map that I've just marked here is, um, well, the, divi or the divisional, <laughs> the force boundary is to the north, there's that black line. Uh, and that yellow highlighted strip is the Mussolini Canal, obviously renamed since. Um, that is put in under, you know, when Mussolini before the war to help drain this area to the east, which is marshy, swampy land um, and kind of like a reclamation project of his uh, in this area. And then they're moving settlers in from the north and it's it's got its own very interesting history. Uh, but this forms basically the quote unquote front line. Um, but as you can see, moving through and looking at different maps, they're well ahead of this line probably more than they should have been at some points, but they are very much ahead of it. So it's it's it's, it's really fascinating. Look at this and what's classified as a front line and, and some of the photos and what you can see what they had to do, but what they actually do in practice is, is very different. Um, and also, of course, the other side of the hill, quote unquote. Um, they're facing most of the time, again, it changes because things happen with offensives and, and, and shifting, 
is the Herman Goring Panzer Division. They yep. face them for the majority of the fighting or holding the line. All this different terminology means different things at different times for this fighting. And, the, and then tanks come up in unexpected ways. Um, but it's not like an infantry force is just going to get overrun by armor. That does not happen here. Yeah, so they move in really quickly once they get in. They, they get like basically one night inside the, the chaotic, crazy beachhead anyway, and they move right in uh, on the second, third of night. Uh, sorry, second, third of February, because you want to do these things at night. Um, so, like I said, the force is under uh, undermanned. And they're holding a huge chunk of the line. I mean, it, it's absolutely massive. I think it's 11,000 meters, which is roughly seven miles. Of mm. So, so that's that that's that's quite a lot <laughs> for a force that is is not up to strength, and is again not trained to do this kind of thing. I'm going to keep harping that, but it's something that sticks out to me, and how they fought while they were there they had to be aggressive in that sense because they don't have the manpower to cover all of this. So you have to do, and this kind of goes back to the other war that doesn't get talked about much on this channel, but World War One, right? You got to dominate no man's land. You've got to keep the enemy on his toes. You got to do all that stuff, right? You got to keep them guessing and moving around, right? Like you can see on this map here, the different events. So all the North is actually the forces patrols that day. This is one particular day. Uh, February 14th, um, and I picked that for, A, this great map, but also for something to do with the legend of the force that we'll get to. Um, but the German actions are actually to the south. So it looks like they had their different ideas of what they're trying to do and where they're trying to push. But as you can see, these events are well ahead of, of the front line. Um, so I just want to talk about, you know, real quick, their training, because it's intensive. Talked about that on your uh, previous other show. They're doing all kinds of stuff, right? Mountain, parachuting, they're all qualified parachutists. Hand-to-hand um, -hand -hand combat, right? That comes up in the movie. That's another scene. Yep. <laughs> and that's mentioned in the War Diary actually quite frequently. And it, it, it was, you know, you could move around and you could do extra hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, it was like almost like an extracurricular for the troops if their officers decided to do that for them. Um, so they would do things like demolition, scouting and patrolling, and infiltration tactics was mentioned multiple times. Again, I'm not used to seeing that, um, particularly from the Canadian perspective. I mean, they did do it, but this war diary really was harping that infiltration, the patrolling, you know, dominating space with patrols. And mm. night fighting is also a big one. And, and I, because well, that, that's I, interesting that, the, that, that you're actually finding that in the sources because yeah. they're often cited as the first real all-round special force which is a bit of a paradox that in that yeah but during world war ii special forces tended to be focused on one particular thing so you have the airborne force you have commandos who do the amphibious it seems to me that the, the legend is built on the fact that they do as you said they're mountain stuff yep. um, patrolling hand-to-hand -hand, which is very much the whole hallmarks of a modern special forces unit who are yep kind of all around firefighters, but it's interesting that that is actually there in the, in the documentation because yep. it's a joke that there's no fighting in the war in, in at night in world war two, but it's yep. a lot less than in the day. It's not, it's, it's something that occurs. Commanders don't really like fighting at night, do they? Generally it's patrolling yeah. happens at night. Generally, but, you know. Yeah. And, and that's the thing because I think the, the commanders, um, particularly at the top with, with, with Frederick realized this is what it had to be. They had yeah, to, yeah. to dominate that time. Again, I just can't not think about the Western Front. And yeah, I really put that as a slide, but it's, it, it, I can't not think about that because it's, it's, it is this nighttime. They're like brawls by any sense, right? If using those kind of generic terms that get thrown around, this is like patrols, counter patrols. That's what the Germans literally start doing around the time I'm looking at is, is counter patrols, which doesn't go well from them. They get ambushed themselves and get wiped out. That's one of the events I'll talk about in the video. But it's it, it it just it doesn't work out for the Germans so well, but for the force it works out extremely well. Um, and just one of the the quotes I was able to take from someone who served there uh, is uh, William McGee, uh, and this is just a quote for him, real quick. We used the Mussolini Canal system as a defensive position, and we kept them at bay. And just because of our constant hammering away, we didn't have to push them. They've moved back five miles, so there is quite a large space between them. Mm. If you see my cursor on the screen, yeah, you can see it. 
Um, so the German front is is basically based around um, Latoria. It's now called uh, Latina, I think. Uh, they changed the name of that one as well. Um, right roughly around this area. And we'll zoom in a little bit further. But it, 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 it is true. I mean, five miles seems like a little much. But, you know, these are recollections from decades later, um, which is sometimes the problem. But that one, I think, gets a sense of this is what they had to do. And, and this is what it had to look like. So real quick, because um, I know some people wanted me to talk about this particular gentleman. Uh, not everyone might know his story. Um, they rather, should, though. They should, um, especially I know people on my channel, follow my channel, definitely do. Talked about him many times. Um, just real quick, he is Tommy Prince, obviously, part of the First Special Service Force. He is indigenous, part of uh, the Ojibwe Nation, from born in, around Winnipeg, I believe, uh, if not in Winnipeg itself. So he serves with the First Special Service Force. Uh, but also, he doesn't stop serving in the Second World War. He serves uh, after the force is disbanded uh, with the, the Parachute Battalion and then serves in Korea. He volunteers to go again. After already seeing war, being decorated literally by the king, he goes back because, this is just a quick aside, he, he didn't feel well treated after the war and, and because he wasn't. Um, and, and then that is one of the, he has a very tragic story after his service in Korea and dies young due to alcoholism and just treated so poorly for what he had done. Uh, he said being in, in uniform made him feel like a person, which says so much about Canadian society at the time and, and the trouble that, you know, um, that it was for Indigenous people or people of color at the time. His story is ultimately tragic. And there was a big thing about him, his medals going to sale to the public. And his band was able to get the medals back, which was a huge story across Canada. Anyway, so he has his best known story, I think, is at Anzio. That's really where it starts. Um, I just lifted this from one of the books I was using. That's not bad, actually, the Joyce book. Um, so it, it's crazy. You can just read it there. I'm sorry about the little uh, no title thing there. But basically, he is working as a scout uh, in this force, working its way across the canal and then out to set up an OP for artillery. Um, for a couple of days, they don't even know <laughs> where he went. <laughs> he just sort of was gone. Um, and one of the points there, the, the wire gets cut for the radio. So he has to go out. He pretends to be an Italian farmer and goes to tie his shoe, quote unquote, to fix the line where it had, where it had broken. Um, and then gets up and shakes his fists at both sides of the line. <laughs> so he looks like a civilian because <laughs> he uh, had, there was clothes inside the house, the farmhouse he was using. So this gets um, attention later. It's not, which is one of the things too I wanted to talk about is it doesn't get attention in the war diary whatsoever. This doesn't come up at all. And, and you can't really get um, service members records. Uh, if they served during the war, it's quite the process. If they didn't die during the war. So I can't find that particular thing, but he was awarded the MM, the military medal, uh, and was given it to by the king himself. So it, it's it's a fascinating story. I think Prince's story overall is fascinating, but I know people like Alex are watching. Sorry, I didn't, I'm not bringing anything new because I tried, and this is the day I originally wanted to profile on that video was this takes place on February 8th, 8th, 9th, 10th-ish. Um, I just couldn't find anything to go with, so I had to pick a different day, unfortunately. But his exploits are are fantastic and, and definitely worth a look. Um, and I'll just leave that up there so people can uh, take a look and read at that real quick. But yeah. again, he's uh, uh, one of the stories that we know from the war really, really well. So the force nickname. Um, <laughs> give me a second here. Uh, and I'm ready for your take on this. <laughs> Not really. Okay. Well, it's a bit of a take. <laughs> it's not like an angry typical you, Brad. You, it wouldn't be you if you didn't have some kind of take on it. You know? it's, a, it's a take, but it's not. Anyway, I'll just go with what I wrote down and then we can maybe get into it. So another reason why I chose the 14th, uh, February 1944, is in the War Diary, um, particularly because the War Diary is in the British tradition, but they're under the American system. There's an S2 intelligence report for basically almost every day which to me is uh, fantastic. Anyway, as the historian nerd, I love it. You get everything as much as you can, especially in comparison to some other units. So in, in, in this report, there is a supposed, and, I, and I'll get to that for, for a reason, <laughs> a supposed diary 
of what is his name of a one uh, lieutenant or lieutenant Heinz Mueller, who is an officer in charge of one of the assault platoons uh, in the Herman Goring division. So he's supposedly writing about his experiences and Anzio. And as you talked about with Alex, uh, the German soldiers said this was awful, right? Some of them said it was worse than Stalingrad. Um, mm. And the, 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 it is awful. I mean, the war diary is full of our planes are overhead, their planes are overhead, the artillery is nonstop. So I can only imagine what that does to, you know, the psychology of a person. Um, but the famous line, and hold on one second here, and this is some of the art, and, and this is the famous sticker or card uh, here on the, sorry, everything's mirrored, the red one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they would leave, you know, saying the worst is yet to come or, you know, the thick of it, the literal translation, something along the lines of, you know, the thick of it is coming or something like that. And then the black devil and everything that's used later on in their books and everything. Uh, and still kind of by their association today. Um, so this is supposedly a translation of this captured document from from Mueller. Um, you can read it there, talking about all this different stuff, um, the heavy artillery fire, um, you know, the bombing, the, the flak fire, um, patrols, you know, stuff you would expect, particularly for this particular early period uh, in, the, uh, in the bridgehead. Uh, so this is the one here. So on the 14th is, again, why I picked this day, but also because it tells quite the story. So I'll just read it out, but you can see it there. Uh, February 14th, enemy patrols in baggy pants are 100 meters from my own OP outpost line. We don't know where they are or when they come. Seems like the seems like black devils are all around. So this line is where the name comes from, black devils. Uh, Devil's Brigade. Why I keep saying supposedly is in one book, in the the book I was using there, sorry, the quote I was just using, I tried to reach for a copy of it, I had a digital copy. Um, it, it's supposedly made up. This supposedly doesn't happen. This is done by its own intelligence officers. Um, does it help the slagging morale of the time? Right. The morale is taking a bit of a hit. The war diary tends to sometimes usually paint a rosier picture than what's actually going on. I hadn't been there that long. It usually takes some time of constant pounding for the you know morale to to decline. But to say that this is fake, the only reason I, I give pause is because there's no copy of it. Typically, when there's captured documents, you see a, a facsimile or something of it. This is just the translation. Like I've seen facsimiles of, of like personnel records, like x-rays from the Germans. Like it's, yeah. it, it, it's, it, it's quite wild that this didn't make it in. And, and why this is happening is, oh, sorry, why this is claimed by um, Joyce, that's a Kenneth Joyce, is supposedly, again, because I can't verify any of this stuff, he spoke to and had a phone conversation. This is... is um, uh, cited in the book, uh, one Gordon Sims, who worked in the intelligence section. He had a phone conversation with him, so can't see the notes, right? Uh, um, who claimed it was made up by the officers because the morale had been lagging. That's the only citation that Joyce uses. It's not verifiable in that way. So uh, at this point, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, the thing that does a little bit stand out to me, and I can see the, the comments in the, in the side there about the baggy pants. Those are ski pants of the time, right? Because yeah. that's what they're trained to do is one of the skills is, is skiing and working in these cold conditions. And it's still fairly not great weather in February in Italy, uh, this part particularly. So they're wearing those clothes. So I think a detail like that would stick out to a soldier, but also they're moving at night. And supposedly, again, they're, 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 they've blackened their faces with boot polish um, to, you know, cover it up. And, you know, we think of the burglar or the soldiers doing that nowadays all the time. So I'm, I'm kind of at that point of I, I don't think that this is accurate. I don't think it's real. Um, but again, I can't verify that in any way, shape or form. And some of the books are too, you know, jingoistic and all that stuff yeah. to be used as a source. So well, it's the same with the British and the Red Devils in North Africa, the paratroopers, yeah. that, that it gets repeated all the time. I mean, it's worth worth getting someone on to try and look at it as a myth because yeah. you know, that's based on the Denison smocks being worn by the paras being all dusty and then the tail that hangs back of the first bat and Denison. But I kind of think 
is that really something that's visible? You know, if do you see what's hanging off someone's back in combat at, at the distances you're talking about? In North, I I don't know. I mean, obviously, what is indisputable is when a unit gets a name like the Red Devils or the Black Devils, it's cool. You're gonna want to, <laughs> exactly. you're gonna want it to stick. The, the minute that, that you're gonna you don't wanna be called that. You know the 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 idiots from something or the the, the sloths or something. If you get a cool nickname, you're gonna yeah. want to keep it. Um, so well, yeah, I mean. Yeah, we don't. I can't verify for sure. I mean, someone said you can't. You can't prove a negative, right? So it's yeah. It, it, but my conclusion from that is, at the end of the day, does it really matter? Um, if your unit is, especially a unit of this size and this training, right? They had been put through a lot of crap <laughs> to get here to go to combat. So if their you know morale is truly really slagging from you know sitting in basically what is holes in the ground for at this point a couple like, about ten days, if not more, um, you know it's is the morale slagging i don't know but it mm. seemed to it seemed to work right you have like you just said why you want a cool name right if you give it to yourself does it really matter yeah, yeah. at the end of the day i mean it, it's it's stuck it still has stuck it's still used it's still what the movies and everything is called um so it's it, it, to me it doesn't really matter at the end of the day obviously as a story you want to know the truth but I don't think we're going to get down to the truth on this one. Um, I mean, someone... well, I think you're onto something though about. I mean, and it's yeah. taking from what Alex said on Monday is that that fighting in the Anzio beachhead was, for many people who fought in it, where be they British, Canadian, American, you know, comparable to Stalingrad. You said yeah. yourself that is, and morale clearly was a problem because it was a long time engaging an enemy in a pretty pretty yep. shitty uh, environment. So, a positive story of the enemy giving you a name. If it is contrived, who cares? Yeah, does it, does it matter? Does yeah, it doesn't matter whatsoever to me in that sense. I mean, it, it has an impact, and obviously the morale of this unit is extremely high after this. Um, the things we'll see, uh, but even afterwards, like even and can't really get into this today, but the disbandment, like the morale is sky high. Yeah, I mean, yeah. fighting the you know southern coast of France is much better than fighting on the northern coast of France. <laughs> you know, the morale is still very high when this unit is disbanded which is largely due to administrative reasons. Another thing I want to talk about is that a lot of this stuff is just, it's just the boring, same old, same old. It's not this stuff of myths. It's not the stuff of movies. They're yeah. not broken up for this, that, and the other thing. The Canadians didn't like the admin. So they said, we're pulling our guys back <laughs> and we need them elsewhere. Sorry. Uh, like it's not really much else than that, unfortunately. But that said, the morale of this unit is sky high when they do disband. And I think that's got a lot to do um, with it. So I don't know. At the end of the day, does it really matter if it works? I say no. <laughs> anyway, yeah. that's my thoughts on that. And I, and I think you're bang on. If, if you get a cool name, who cares? Right? Does it matter? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think so. Um, so just moving on from that, I'm sure there'll be comments later, and I'm interested to hear them. Um, if anybody has more than me, hey, fire away. Um, so Alex, again, talked about this, the, the mid-February offensive. So, so this is on the sector, as you can see, pretty far away from the Special Service Force right here, because this is the canal, and this is their area. So there's not a major push um, from the Germans on this side. Uh, there's a little bit, like there's a feint, basically, um, that they fight off, um, but not too, too much. A, a few tanks, nothing major. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the... Uh, yeah, so the artillery actually is the thing that really does the damage um, to this small, very tiny feint. Um, they mentioned three tanks and a self-propelled gun being knocked out uh, along their front at the time, uh, roughly around, I think it's the 17th or 18th, uh, around that time. Um, the word diary is not really specific on it. It doesn't really talk too, too much, uh, but it's very minor. Like this is the big thing and all the things I've seen about Anzio is this time, right? This German push. Um, but for this first special service force, uh, it's, it's not much, it's just seemingly another day for them um, with what's going on in the salient. Unfortunately, uh, for those wanting a bigger story, again, there is not much going on there um, if you're, that's what you're, if you're looking for there. So, and this leads to my other point I wanted to make here and that I made earlier is this is like the trenches of the First World War particularly the Western Front. I mean, if I had cropped this off at the bottom, you know, what war is that from? It could be any of them, you know? Mm. <laughs> so, mm. but it, it, this is what it looks like. There's video of this. There's tons of photos of this. 
of this pockmarked land um, that's a little wet because of the swamps. Um, so, so you have a lot of this, but also why it's, it's I find, again, based on my own research in, the, in that war, especially, it, it's not just the shelling, the constant shelling, the terrible conditions, the, the static warfare. It's, it's almost the attitudes and, and observations that you see, right? Because um, again, relying heavily on the war diaries here, A for just because I find the stories in the war diaries are always the best. Um, but the second line um, in it here is, is fascinating to me. So our combat echelon is very indignant and feel insulted to find an Italian Marine unit is being used to oppose them instead of all the German units encountered to date. So <laughs> you can tell they, they've come into contact and they are not happy that this is who they're fighting. <laughs> They want a better enemy. I, I, I've not seen this exactly, but it's almost got this humorous tinge to it of how dare they were better than this. What are they doing putting these crappy soldiers in front of us? Again, I can't speak to the strength of Italian Marine units at this point in the war. Uh, probably not great. <laughs> um, but it, it's just so interesting because I've seen these things in the First World War diaries that, you know, it, it's just almost this monotony. You want to find anything to, to note, to, to take away, to to provide some insight. It's not necessarily always about the intel or what it can provide for future ops. It, it, it's just stuff like this. It, it, it's quite funny to me, at least. I thought it was hilarious that they're upset of who the Germans throw in front of them. Um, so this is another one I, I thought was really, really interesting for just all kinds of reasons. Uh, it, it, it talks about the shelling. Again, like I said, is pretty ubiquitous at this point. Um, sorry, one second here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's pretty ubiquitous. It, it causes all kinds of damage. Um, as you can see there, it says quantity and caliber is increasing. Um, but one of uh, the American officers is captured and then is able to escape from the capture um, near Latoria, which we saw on the map there. It's outside the line. Um, but here I'll just read it out here. Is, uh, so soon after a German officer started questioning him, our artillery opened up and the Huns beat it and he escaped. He had beat, been beaten on the neck with a rubber hose when he failed to answer, answer questions. Hun prisoners can expect some rough treatment from here in. So this obviously is showing that this is not good, <laughs> right? The Germans are trying to get as much information as they can about what's going on. Um, but this idea, and I've run into this is basically, I'm pointing this out because of my own work uh, about how the allies treated POWs. Mm. There's nothing else going on here um, talking about it uh, any further. I didn't see anything else because these are the months I covered uh, all the way up until the breakout. And even after, I didn't see anything of that. Obviously, it's not going to be mentioned, but it doesn't come up really at all. It's just we bagged some POWs, threw them back in the cage, and interrogated them. So are they beating them up? I, I don't know. Uh, probably some of them. Um, but it can just tell that this stuff is getting worse and this has mm. been almost a, over a month now and, and things are obviously getting bad for both sides i think is my takeaway from from that especially um but again this isn't something i would this isn't something that's out of the ordinary for a war diary of pretty much any commonwealth unit from the first world war um, so this is another one here uh, i thought was really interesting so this is the training of the canadian reinforcements that did come eventually they did come. Uh, the government allowed it. Um, they pulled them out, uh, but they weren't fully up to standard in the training on U.S. weapons, right? Because this is a U.S. kitted right, yeah. force. I saw some questions about like the, the uniforms and stuff. It's other than, yeah, like the unit identifiers that we saw in some other photos from Alex's uh, presentation. Uh, it's all American supplied. So they have to use these American weapons. It, it's a mix, right? Because the Canadian force is using a mix uh, for some of the war, depending on, you know, you know, when they enlisted and, and where they were and, and all kinds of stuff. So it's not uncommon, but a lot of the small arms are, right? They're not using the M1. They're not using any of that stuff. The pistols are different. So they have to get them up to snuff on that. So you can see here, they're talking about the way that the force operates. Uh, they need training, which is done behind the lines. And they use people who were fighting, which again is a rarity, right? To pull people mm. off. To train reinforcements who are but getting trained in the, the in the bridgehead, which, like we said, is under fire all the time, all of it, including the harbor. 
which there's some crazy footage of that, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and then also why I think it's so interesting is another raid is going on, constant air raids. Like they mentioned this constantly about this planes getting taken out both sides, um, seemingly nonchalantly, even if it's an allied plane going down. They don't really seem to care. Um, they just noted again, another one went down. So it's just, to me, it's an interesting look at, again, this kind of mentality that I think had kind of gripped the force at the time, if you can call it that, uh, about what they're focused on and whatnot, right? I always want more people to come and support you in the front line. So this is, to me, is no different. Um, and this one I just thought, where is it? Uh, oh, yeah, this one I just thought was funny. Again, uh, the booze, can't not think about the booze in the front line in the trenches. Um, a liter of gin per officer was distributed on the beachhead today. Rather a change of policy for the dry, quote unquote, U.S. Army. So getting the gin ration, something that sticks out, obviously. Because that's Rito gin's a fair amount, isn't it, really? That's a lot. <laughs> I think they're supposed to share. Um, yeah, they don't really talk about that after that. <laughs> so I can only imagine... Uh, what happened to all that gin? But that is a ton of gin for an individual. Not speaking from experience or anything. Um, and again, just the, the thing of the back and forth, right? Another point I wanted to bring up is, uh, I just saw a question about this now, actually. Um, the allied air dominance. Why doesn't it exist? Yeah. Um, this is a, something I wanted to make. A, because it's got a funny line in it. Um, the Luftwaffe has passed up another moonlight night to visit us. Hope he's getting flacky, flacky, wacky. I've never heard that phrase before. I've never heard that one. Flacky, wacky. That's a new one. That was like, I got to include this. I don't care. It's just funny. But I've never heard that before. So I guess uh, they call it flacky, wacky. If you're getting shot at and you're getting a little tired of it, so you don't run that night. Um, but that's the thing, right? Is this supposed expectation, is the word, of allied air dominance at this point in the war, right? Early 44. It's just, it's not the case at Anzio, right? It's because of the front lines and where they are, the conditions of Italy, where can you put these airfields? Um, where can they be based out of? That's the issue here. There's a lot more going on here. And this is before really the attritional parts of the other theaters are really starting to take an impact on the Luftwaffe here. So they are able to, to cause quite a bit of damage uh, actually. Um, there's all kinds of accounts of, of uh, fuel dumps going up and like can be seen across the beachhead. Um, planes coming down, ships going up, um, you know, AA fire, like crazy, um, all kinds of stuff. It, it, it's something that, again, I like that question. It's almost unexpected. But at this point, the Luftwaffe is very much involved. So this is just a really good photo. It's obviously, I think, a little staged, but it's neither here nor there, is um, the rating. Call it rating, patrolling, mostly patrolling. Um, small things like firefights, like I talked about before, contacts, uh, OPs. Uh, oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, and if this is a good place for this, is the high level of observation, I guess you can call it. The war diary has things in there. You're like, why did you write that down? Why is this in an S2 report? Things like we saw a knocked out tank over here. And it's been like that for who knows how long. Like, okay, it's a tank, it's gone. Who cares? This is not even mm -hmm. close to our front line. But that's how they were trained. They were trained to note everything. And that's what they did. And they were it brings it. us back this idea of them being an all-round special forces unit. Yep. They're, they're reconnaissance, paratrooper, night fighting. Yep. It, that's that that's a testament to how they are perceived and how they've been set up. Because yep. it, 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 um, as a Brit, yeah. A British infantryman does what he's told, but doesn't do beyond that. Generally, it's that you know, if you're told to go out and check on the enemy numbers, you do that. If you're not told to do that, you don't bother. You, you, you. I mean, I'm, I'm slighting my country's British infantry, but it, <laughs> the idea is, is these guys are are are, are thinking um, beyond necessarily the, the 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 rigidity of their orders, which, as you said at the beginning, is yeah. basically holding a line. But it's far yeah. from holding a line when you look at it in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I mean that was a necessity, like I said, but. Also, that's just their training. That's what they're trained to do. This was supposed to be their job, right? They were initially supposed to get dumped in the middle of Norway and basically good luck. You know, yeah. we'll come get you when we can, right? So having to do with this on this condition, um, I can't not think about it. It kept coming up in my head still working on this. It's from the show. I don't know if it's in the book, but 
Generation Kill about on it was on HBO about the, yeah. the Marine, recon Marines and how heavily trained they are and, and what their roles they're supposed to play. One of the characters says it's like sending a Ferrari into a bash up derby. And I could not think stop thinking about it like this. You you would have this highly trained force that a it's a lot of money to do this stuff and yeah. a lot of time. And then you just throw them what are essentially into trenches and say, hold this position. Don't let them come across this canal. Um, so you're going to get interesting results, I guess is the best way to say it. Um. <laughs> is, that, is that connected with that transitional period of the Allies generally moving towards what they're going to be using, what we would now call special forces for? Because we talk about on this channel endlessly, the early British commander ops of 41 are, are very much small unit going into a, a very specific thing without necessarily a very good escape plan. And then by the end of the war, you have it much more on regimental lines. Lines. The SAS now is a proper British Army regiment that kind of works in a regimental way. You see the similar thing with the range battalions in the US Army. So this period of early 44, is that is that because it's still transitioning? Yeah, that's that's my sense because, well, they like I said before, right, they just get plumped into fifth army and there you go here's a mountain this is what you've been trained to do but you know go do it but then yeah. here you're thrown into anzio to plug the line right when it's when is saying that the, the fssf guys were utter crazies who intended for a near suicidal mission they were misused anzio yeah that's exactly my point i mean because you get these interesting results right throwing in these guys who are so trained and know what they're doing right down to the the, the you know the base level of say as a private and is making these observations because these are not big yeah. roles. These are a handful at most, most of them, right? Because that's just what you do um, just to keep things, keep an eye out basically. Um, but then they're obviously taking this initiative, like like I said, going a bit back here with that raid or the stuff on the 14th that I'm going to be covering is all kinds of things. Like they notice an explosion. We don't know why that happened. Like who else would note that? You know, was that an ammo dump? Was that a shell? We don't know, but let's keep an eye on it. Or, hey, we found ammo boxes. That still had rounds in them and otherwise empty foxholes. What's going on here? You know, I mean, like I've never seen stuff like that. It never gets noted, uh, and as a, it doesn't really come to much. But you don't know that, right? So, so to me, it's this weird transitional period. It's we have this force that's been earmarked for the Mediterranean. What do we do with it? Basically, so they just kind of plug them in and things like that. And I saw some uh, questions there uh, about Italy. Is this the only place they fight? No, they fight in, and I saw your answer, but Operation Dragoon. That is where they are used for what they should have been used for. They're used to going ahead and, you know, infiltrate some of the smaller islands out to neutralize some guns, but, and to use this infiltration, this amphibious training, this basically on your own, get it done kind of mentality. So, you see it mixed, right? It comes up again, and it seems like back and forth. It seems like they don't know what to do with this force, yeah. Unless the situation, you know, calls for it, because th they had the same role at Kiska: get in first, set it up, support the landing. Obviously, yeah. it doesn't happen, and then they get to Italy, and they're thrown up the side of the mountain with very little train or little time to prepare, and that they still pull it off because of their training, and then you shove them in what are basically trenches for what, three, four months. Uh, four months, three months ish. And it's just like, I, to me, I can't quite get a read on it, but that is my sense. They don't know what to do with them um, until later. But, and I think that has a lot to do with things like the planning for overlord and some of the lessons learned and, and things that are going on in Italy, but they never were going to be, you know, those small commandos parachuting in and, you know, having that type of movie made about 30 years later, right? Like it was never supposed to be that. But it, mm. but it wasn't supposed to be frontline infantry either. So I don't I'm know. glad you're doing this, Brad, because we talked about the books at the beginning. The books have uh, quite the ones I've read are quite celebrate. Uh, cele I can't say the word now. They're, they're <laughs> a celebration of of yes. the ethos of the of the special forces, but they don't yeah. really go into the use of them and any kind of questioning of of yep. whether or not they were deployed in the way that was best suited to their to their ability. And and you know. Clearly, it goes without saying, they were very well trained. They were a high quality soldier. They were very good at what they did. The question yeah. is, were they were they given enough opportunities to really demonstrate what they were good at? But you could extend that also to the parachute regiment and the commandos and, and, every, and by extension, every other um, yeah. special force the Allies were deploying. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's just, it's such an interesting thing. And, and 
why the story, I guess, is really sticking with me in, in that sense is is what you th come to think of as Anzio, right? This stalemate, slow, we sit here a while, wait for, you know, the other armies to kind of catch up <laughs> and kind of help us out a little bit. I'm sure some of them won't like me saying that, but, you know, the Eighth Army's coming over and the other Americans are coming up. And that's also what helps the breakout, obviously. Um, but having these guys, and then they do come to the front, we'll get there, but they do lead part of the breakout as well, which they are yeah. better used yeah. as. But just holding this line to me is just not a good use of this force. No. Um, so, yeah, this is the raid I, I uh, was talking about here. See, so I'll just leave that up for a second. But it's just the, the casualties that they're able to cause and the low casualties they are they, they take is rather impressive. And these things I have checked because you can <laughs> you can see casualties, particularly for the Canadians, right? We we have so every like soldier. Yeah, the other yeah. sixty ranks captured. Yeah, uh, with one yeah one loss. Yeah, one loss. Um, yeah, and then you know two tanks are taken out that they work with tanks. Also, they're able to do combined arms, <laughs> so that's another thing. I mean, they were training for this before this raid. This was done specifically um, for this raid. But you can just I'll leave it here again. But it, it's part of it. But it's a bigger thing, right? It's it's. It's showing what it could have been, I guess, is what I'm trying to say in, in a bigger sense, because that comes up uh, also after the breakout, um, working with armor. But again, when you're stuck in a position, you're just told to hold, what more can you expect? Yeah. Um, so this is where the raid takes place. Again, I just got to show off these maps because they are fantastic. Um, this is to the southwest here, right? So this little dip up here, oh, I got, I moved it out. But this is where the front line actually is, just off the map. So it's quite a distance out there because, again, this is the main area uh, for the Germans to this side. I think it's obvious reason why with the roads leading in um, and, and nowhere else to go because of the marshes. Um, so this is a main center. Um, so this raid got pretty close and, and is able to do some damage and, and again, keep them um, on their toes, basically, for, for what's coming. So um, just leave that there for now. So eventually they are withdrawn from the front. So they, they are basically brought to the center uh, of the bridgehead um, uh, on the 8th. And they are waiting, basically, um, for their role to come with the breakout. And I've highlighted it here uh, of what they do just overall from the breakout here. Um, and this is, again, from the Canadian official history. But again, they talk about Constantly being under fire, you know, constant again, even at this point, it hasn't stopped. So it's, it, it's again, fascinating to, again, to, that they mention this in every source as we're under artillery fire and we're under air raids constantly. Um, it's, it's just something that doesn't end. Um, and at this point, so again, numbers are difficult to, to get properly for the overall force because as things tend to be, people focus on their own nationalities. Right. Um, and the U.S. Army sources I were using were just overall sources. So they didn't focus on any particular units. So I was only really able to find Canadian casualties. Um, and it's 117 Canadian casualties at Anzio. Uh, and that comes with the other ones they brought on. So they're actually backed up to strength and then some uh, by the time the breakout happens. Um, those who had that training uh, with the U.S. weapons I was talking about earlier. So... Here's the map from the U.S. Um, Army book uh, showing the breakout. So the first Special Service Force is just moved up a little bit to the north, and they strike out this direction, obviously. And it goes well, like much of the breakout does. They're able to cut Highway, I don't know if you can see it so well for the viewers, but Highway 7, uh, they're able to do that very easily. There is a bit of resistance and, and a bit of rejigging and trying to figure it out. And something else I want to know about note about this is at this time for the war diary and how it's written, they have literally no idea what's happening. <laughs> Whoever wrote the war diary does not know what's going on. They say the combat echelon is up there and we think they're doing good. We don't know. And so they don't get the official, like, this is what happens until the next day. And they're like, oh yeah, they took their objective. So it's, 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 it's so interesting to me that these things are so all over the place. I guess that's my biggest takeaway is this doesn't fit the story you think it does. It, it, it's not this movie. It's not these special forces doing these amazing things. It's the same old, same old, really, when it comes to 
land operations, right? No one knows what's happening. Things are not always going to plan. They get counterattacked um, by the uh, by the Germans with infantry and armor. Um, so they temporarily have to withdraw. You can see that a little bit here, uh, where they have to push back a little bit. Uh, but they're able to, um, I'll go back, uh, obviously stop that and then connect up with the French that are coming from the south um, after the push up past Casino and all that, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, and also where you can see the 8th Army coming up, where the Canadian stuff comes from, <laughs> the Canadian chip on the shoulder there, um, where they get basically taken out of the line of, uh, of the fighting. So these are, again, I just want to, as a lot of us do, um, really love maps <laughs> guess that's not it, it doesn't come across at all no no i know right it's uh it's uh something i hide i just love them because they are very well done um and they can kind of show what they're facing and how quickly the breakout actually happens right because this is it starts on the 23rd ish 22nd overnight and by the 31st they, they've basically pushed all the germans back what they couldn't do for months and they're able to do that. And you can see the special service force is up to the north yeah. and able to push on to Rome. Um, and again, this one, oh, uh, why is that there? There we go. Sorry. There we go. Uh, again, these are the things I was talking about earlier is these uh, these traces, the diaries just follow them. This is fantastic. I just want to get in there because I think it looks good. Um, and it can just show you what is available in these word diaries. And these are all available online to anybody who wants them. Um, I can give you a link later to put up. Um, but they're all on the Canadian uh, archive website. That's where I got them all from. So it, it's, it's great to see them. Um, so there's just one thing I did want to read, or is it two that I have? Uh, I'll just read the one. Uh, so this is another recollection from a Canadian who was uh, part of the breakout. So I'm quoting him, on the breakup from Anzio, the chief scout and I were in a foxhole. There was pretty heavy shelling taking place. And he said to me, Jim, he said, I think we better get down. And for some unknown reason, I'll never know, we changed places in the foxhole and got down. A shell hit the corner where I had been and killed him. Although I was shaken up pretty badly, I was able to keep going on to Rome. So again, you hear that all the time, but this is what he remembers, right? All of a sudden, he's just shifting position. It's one of those things about luck and war, right? You're standing in the wrong spot or the right spot. Uh, but then he's like, okay, we just got to keep going. And that is what they do. Um, and there's other ones, same sort of thing. Um, the tanks are recalled. Uh, a commander is killed on the breakout. So for a force that's not taking very high casualties or, high, you know, quote-unquote, high-profile casualties, until the end, they start coming really at the end, uh, and they really start to take some casualties as they get out of this static warfare, which again is not unexpected. Um, so it doesn't really surprise me. So this is, uh, again, I'm sure you'll talk about the uh, bigger overall picture. We'll, we'll do the drive for Rome with, um, that's what James Bond uh, we talking about. Right, right. Though. That's what he wants to tackle. So I just wanted to throw these up. So they're from the, this is one of the uh, S2 reports. Or S3, sorry. Uh, reports about what's going on. I just can leave it up to people to read on their own. Uh, but this is just about them, what they're doing, and, and how they do take their objectives in Rome, how they're attached um, to a armored unit, which they work with very well, which is, again, showing that high level of not necessarily even training, because it, it's hard to do that, right? That's one of the biggest things of the war is infantry armor cooperation. Yeah. It's their ability, I think, to learn is huge, right? That's yeah. like undervalued. Yeah, give, they've had they've had the tools of how to learn quickly, and therefore, in this situation, because they've learned so many things, yeah. adding another trick, uh, I guess, is is fairly fairly routine for them. Yeah, I think I think that's a good way to put it, and and, that, and that's not a bad thing, right? That they are at this ability to do so. I mean, that has a lot to do with with personnel selection. And adaptable, right? yeah, yeah. That you talked about with on the other show with um, I forget his name. Um, way back when. Um, anyway, uh, it, 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 who they picked and, and who they weeded out from the force and, and the experiences that they have had. So this is, um, again, just part of the things going into Rome and how they're able to um, take their objectives actually after um, failing to do so, because sorry, I'll come back to that in a second. I mean, obviously, this is a good picture of them in Rome, right? This is one of the areas it's Full of Latin, literally. It's a fantastic photo, that one. Yeah. However, this photo is them retreating, um, which you don't see. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a um, it's a momentary retreat, 
to regroup and, and push again. Um, so the bridges are taken later than they're supposed to be taken. Um, but I just thought it was so interesting. It's because I've seen this photo, I don't know how many times, um, that and the other one with the kid and the Jeeps, um, yep. same thing. But this one is actually from a retreat, which is interesting. And I will call it that because that's what it is. Um, you just don't see that, especially with forces like this, right? It's always victory. It's always good. We don't have problems. So that's just why I want to include this Rome stuff without really getting into too many details because uh, it's not really what I want to talk about. It's more of the overall experience and, and mm -hmm. what this force was able to do. And like I said, misused. I think it's it's highly misused. Um and you can see why I think that I think the evidence is clear, but also in a way they aren't misused. Again, this is going to be weird, but because what they're able to do, like I already talked about, right? What they're able to do with patrolling and things like that, that I don't think quote unquote normal units would be able to do to that degree. So, but because they're but because they're good at doing something doesn't contradict the fact they're misused. I mean, yeah, it, it's a, yep. that. Yeah, I mean, they were good at what they were doing, but that yeah. doesn't still, yeah, that doesn't mean that should have been the thing they're doing. And I think I was going to talk to about the Kevin gets asked earlier about, which is kind of what I asked at the beginning, mm -hmm. how much does the popular culture, aka the Devil's Brigade, hurt or help the Anzio story? In the, my research for this, is it's all about Mount uh, La Defensa, that, because yeah. that is all the defense, back in yeah. December 40th, it's much more your classic yeah. uh, out of a Hollywood plot special forces mission go and take the hill and, def and yep. defend it against counterattacks that fits into that idea we have of what unit like this should be doing whereas this defensive stroke patrolling holding of that of the, of the canal in anzio isn't for months but as we said isn't really what we think of when we think of a unit of this of this caliber yeah exactly so i think yeah the the, the popular culture the the focus on not that it's not an amazing feat, but the taking of, of uh, Monte Mayo and, and, and La Defensa are not. They are amazing things to do and should be recognized. But again, this is months of sitting around, active patrolling. This isn't, uh, in my video, I said this isn't the, the glamour of offensives and pushing forward and taking Rome. This is sitting in a muddy hole, stopping the Germans from coming over. It's not much. It doesn't make for good stories. I feel like my last two appearances here are very anticlimactic, <laughs> talking about how the RCR didn't do too much combat until they did. And this one's kind of the same, right? It's it, it's a lot of, well, it's like war, right? And it's, that's sometimes the, the thing. It's a lot of sitting around, a lot of doing nothing. It's a lot of uncomfortable situations. It's, it's not advancing. This isn't all Saving Private Ryan, right? This is not how war goes. This is more realistic this is what it's actually like and this is from the end of just real quick for this from the actual end of, of, of february 44 for their war diary this is basically summing up um, their experience their first month there um, which i think does a good job even though it's written by themselves right of, of talking about what they did um, and, and where some of my conclusions come from is just from this passage but it, it, things like the enemy having the high ground and, and the constant observation and the constant shelling and things like that, and how they were able to hold it together. I think the line, the, the boys have been have done a wonderful job, thumbs it up amazingly. Mm -hmm. And again, that whole, uh, you know, myth, or sorry, uh, you know, the fog of war, they think they have less troops than they actually have when they're writing the diary, um, which I think is hilarious um, because they're <laughs> able to get actual American reinforcement. They get Rangers actually get attached to them. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's just absolutely wild that they were not really sure what's going on half the time, but that's war for you. And I think that's another, I don't know, myth about special forces. They're always in control. They always know everything is going as we expect, right? And that's just not the case for most war, and this is no different. Uh, and I think in, in An the Anzio beachhead, I think the fog of war is particularly dense if we're going to carry yeah. on with the fog of war analogy. It's a uh, there's all sorts of criticisms that can be leveled at command decisions, just the, the planning, the, the swiftness of the planning. The, yep. I mean, the, even the crappy 1960s movie Anzio kind of covers the, uh, yeah. the in, in a in a ridiculous way with Robert Mitchum not giving one of his best performances. Uh, but it does <laughs> kind of cover that that confusion is not the quite word, but mismanagement perhaps. Yeah, of, I think that's a better whole, word. A whole operation. Yeah, and I and I think that's um, that's a good way to sum it up. Um, it, it's again, I didn't get into like the core level stuff, 
or or all of that because I know we I don't want it to run on forever. I mean, as you guys know, I can talk forever, but uh, it's not good for the viewers afterwards. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you know, it, 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 it's it's an interesting way I think of looking at this. I came at this not from the expectation you would think, right? Like, oh, special, you know, first special service wars, you know, Devil's Brigade. Here's a great story. Let's just do it for YouTube. It's great. Well, great I mean, story. I'm glad you did what you did because that, that yeah. kind of goes, anyone who's read a book about this, the, the, the tales of them, you know, their survival training on mountains. It's it's fantastic. It's 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 everything you need in a daring do uh, history. It's the same as the, you know, the SAS kind of training. It's fantastic. But yeah, analyzing their their role and their use i think is is a more informative process for the for the world war ii tv hardcore but we've got a couple of questions we'll deal with yeah um if you don't mind um a comment from trent is saying putting an elite unit like the force into an artillery and trench warfare position just boggles the mind and when you put it like that it kind of does it it doesn't it, it doesn't really make sense yeah it, it, i know we keep saying that but it just it, it i can see why they did it um but also why it was such a bad idea. I mean, like you I mean, said, Anzio was so poorly planned. Uh, again, whatever, people can come after me if they want. But yeah, it's so yeah. poorly planned. It's, it seems like it's a fire brigade the whole time. Oh, we got this force. They can take one third of the line, even though that doesn't fit the typical doctrine, uh, as I understand it anyway, of the U.S. Army in the Second World War, of literally, you know, soldier per chunk of land. It, it, it's not fitting that. But uh, it'll be fine. Uh, you know, the geography's fine. I mean... It did work out fine. Is that because of what the force was able to do? Is that the geography? We'll never know. I'm sure the force's actions of getting in there and causing some, you know, panic amongst these crews, like some of the accounts that I'll, I'll talk about for my video, is they, they come these patrols, they make contact with the Germans, and they just book it out of there. They don't do anything. Mm -hmm. They just run. So, I mean, is that part of it? I don't know. But it, to me, it's it is mind boggling. And uh, Trent's right. It just it's so odd and it's such a and a thing and that's another thesis i'm kind of working on i don't know what i'll do with it but it's this for the force generally i guess is they're but I'm putting glad, I'm, yeah i'm glad brad we're at an era where we can take it for granted that some of these units are fab but at the still at the same time question how they were used i mean example in normally that i might be doing something about in june is the use of Thurbatan 506 in the 101st to defend the wooden bridges there's also yeah, just right. service cross actions there i would question the sending in of that battalion to that area at all. In that I would defend it from the drop zone. So you can have those two things going at the same time. You can admire the bravery of the people at the bridges and what they did there. But you can also say, but personally, I wouldn't have put them in that environment in the first place. I'd have held that force somewhere else and then put your reasons for where, where why you'd put them somewhere else at the same time uh, as as questioning or examining what they actually did. And I think that's that's, I'm glad we're at that era now where we can yeah, same. we can accept that special forces are special. That's why they're, 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 we can accept they're good. We can also say, but maybe they could have been used better. Well, but, that's that's another thing. I guess I, I I wanted to talk about. I didn't put it in any notes or anything. Is is the terminology? I mean, you and me have talked about terminology before, but the fact that they're called a special force, right? They're, they're not special forces yet. Right? This is still coming. Yeah, we we didn't even have that that yeah. two word moniker. Yeah, didn't even exist. I don't think. Not yet. So that's what I mean. And then obviously it's been brought up, and a lot of people know this. These are this unit is is the precursor to both American and Canadian. They're in the lineages of both special forces. They have the special force in the name, but it's not in the way we think about it. And no, I, and I think yet. that's one of those things that you know projecting backwards is a bit of a disservice in understanding what all of this means, um, what this force was supposed to do, what it was envisioned to do, what it actually did. Uh, one of the questions I saw is, you know, what else could they have done and used them for? I, I don't know. I think, again, it would have to get into levels a lot higher than this. I mean, it was a chief of staff, a joint chief, sorry, combined chief of staff decision to send them to Italy. I think they heard mountain warfare from Montana and said, oh, Italy has mountains, <laughs> you know, throw them out there. I mean, it's it, it seems like they were more you know, suited for things like La Defensa, obviously, and, and Mount de Mayo, and, and what they did at Dragoon. Obviously, there's not a lot of that going on here. I mean, them being coming later to me at Anzio feels strange in a sense. You know, why are they not the vanguard at Anzio? Why are they yeah. coming over a week later and then just plugging the line? You know, why? Well, that, Ian Carr not... made that point, is what yeah. other action could the yeah. unit have been allotted to in this time scale? Is that is that... Certainly in the breakout, they could have been, I mean, that they, as you said, they did very well in the breakout, the breakthrough, yeah. but maybe they could have been used for something more ahead of 
some kind of armored punch or you know something more more uh on a strategic level rather than them just being one of the other units in the yep. line but um but you'd have to kind of look at the maps and things and say, well, what could they have possibly done that might have been? But then, but look at how many operations were cancelled for air for airborne troops between uh, yep. Overlord and Market Garden because yep. it's difficult finding finding the right well, that's the thing, right mission for the right unit. Yeah. It's not I, yeah. I couldn't get that out of my head, right? Because that's the argument that's always made about Market Garden is we have this force, you got to use them. Obviously, that's going on here too. I think that has a lot to do with the the, the chief of staff decision. Is we've got this highly trained force. Kiska was a bust. Um, what else can we do? Um, we got to use them, right? You can't just disband them, um, which is what ends up happening anyway. But it's even above their pay grade, so to say, um, of why they break apart. Um, so it's, it, it, I think that's part of it. But, you know, what they could have been in, obviously, this is Monday morning quarterbacking, but it just, it seems like a waste of resources. And, the, and that is a bigger theme for so many operations. And this well, I mean, we just different. had a comment about the the fifty second Lowland Division. There, oh, no, not that one. There, that now there's another unit that was that was conceived yeah, for exactly. something, yeah, and then was very good at something else, but it wasn't yeah. something they've been specifically put together for. So, yeah, you know, that's... well, I mean, and there's another comment I can see is, is Casino. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the the, the French uh, Moroccans did extremely well. Same with the Poles. I don't know why are they not in the vanguard of that one. I mean, I mean, there's yeah, always that, that's a very good point. It's hard to, hard to find anything to say, yeah, against that one. Yeah, yeah but why? Why Fifth Army, right? It's just like and then moved out and in and out and in and they they, they plug them in and, and seemingly it's like it's like a, what was you say earlier? It's like half right, half wrong. It's like yeah, let defensive. Yeah. That makes sense. Damn guard Kiska makes sense. This one makes but, sense. But again, we're 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 going back to this idea that in the years after war, a much clearer vision was put together about. Yes the use of special force. I know that's a very generic umbrella term because with yep. underneath that, you have all sorts of specialist um, branches and sub branches and Navy and army. But I think you know, we, we basically the allies go into world war two without anything that anybody would really call what we would label today special forces. And, and, and midway through the war, we're, we're brimming with them. They're, they're, they're overflowing. <laughs> you know, people, anybody with an idea can go and kind of go to church and you get, you got a special unit, uh, on your lap the next day and then well, by the end of the war it's kind of bringing yeah. it it's like raining it all in now okay now come on you know yeah. hand back your unit <laughs> you know but that's what every and that, that's the fact they're all fighting for their lives merrill's marauders the rangers the sas that the soe all of these units that we take for granted are all now at the end of the war going uh but can we still can we still play you know and it, yeah it takes I, mean, time. I just want to go we're back because again it's got the name special forces in it i don't this might whatever but it doesn't seem to me as fitting the definition of special forces as we think about it today i mean putting that term on them doesn't quite fit in my in my opinion especially reading about what they were what they did what they were trained to do right they're supposed to do mountain warfare and then they spent a huge amount of time on amphibious landing yeah a massive amount of time i mean the word then half these cool. like, these names were given accident i mean the sas yeah. was they adopted yeah. the name of the unit that was a decoy unit so yes. it you know we we are we attribute meanings to some of the words now through yep. a 21st century lens exactly. that weren't being used to those words back then they were almost like using a a random word generator thing <laughs> to just come up with words that sounded yeah. different um yeah like a band name generator yeah yeah, like I mean, in like, whenever a new tour guide sets up in Normandy, every permutation of Normandy guide has now been explorer, discoverer, because there's only yeah. so many options you can to explain yeah. that you do tours of to, to the, the beaches. But a couple more questions, then we'll bring things yeah. to end. So this one's an interesting one because I'm, I'm, it's a, it's a source one, like the nickname. This is one from very early in the show. Manny Lopez said. Um, Bill Malden said that the first special service troop had a reputation of tactics to scare the Germans, putting heads onto poles in front of their positions. Any truth to that? Not that I know of. Um, I've heard things like that. I don't know if there's any truth to them. I, um, I, 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 I've heard things like that, but I, I would think when you well, go back to it, there wouldn't be much. I, well, you see this too. I see this all the time in, in the kind of work I do um because I, like i do normandy too right so it's it, it covers this whole you know it's animosity it's it's psychological warfare all of that stuff uh, and we have all these stories but they're always like second or third hand so i yeah. tend to be like 
yeah, okay. Um, that's great, but that doesn't mean anything. I can say anything I want, second, third hand, doesn't mean it has to be true. I mean, I, I have never seen anything like that. I mm -hmm. doubt we'll ever get any proof of anything like that. Yeah. Uh, obviously not in the war diary. It's not in the recollections and interviews done by, you know, the Canadian encyclopedia in the nineties, you know, you're not going to see that. So it's, yeah. it, it's, I think it's exaggerated because you have the things like the, the, in the slideshow, the, the card, right? The, the worst is yet. I mean, the card definitely existed, didn't it? I mean, that we yeah, the card really definitely happened. existed. Um, I mean, again, how much it's used. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't think it was used all that often, to be honest. It doesn't really make sense given the type of combat that they're engaging in, particularly at Anzio. I mean, they're talking about, you know, tanks and, and stuff like this and artillery barrages. And it's like, well, I'm going to leave a little card to scare you. I mean, the things, other things they were able to do, like patrolling has that effect, right? And that's not just me saying this because I've never been through that. But the, the patrolling, the dominating the no man's land, this is why I wanted to hype that, or sorry, you know, focus on that, is that has, you know, an impact, right? Dominating this space that's supposedly empty, you, you never know. I mean, that word, we can go back to the diary, right? From this possibly fake, yeah. you know, Lieutenant M Mueller, like, that, that is real. That can be real because I've seen that. So, I mean, is that the real psychological things? And there's always just, you know, pub talk about what I did in the war. I don't know. It's hard to do. Ultimately, the, it, it's an interesting subject for conversa com a conversation at a later date because the psychological aspect that is now a routine part of, of, yeah. of you know, psyops, you know, and, and yep. Ron Spears came up in the sidebar a minute ago and Ron Spears was, in fact, involved in the 60s in psychological warfare yeah. developing these kind of things and it goes into you know cambodian vietnam these things become you know very very um, commonplace but back then some of these psychological stuff kind of happened accidentally there's all i mean the gurkhas came up i mean i, I was in yeah. a military town where Gurkha, and you know this idea the gurkhas they have to if they pull their cookery out of their their sheath they have to draw blood no they don't yeah. I, I've I've been shown a cookery by a Gurkha several times back in my youth, and they didn't have to stab anybody before they put it back in the sheath again. So these things they exist, and again, I don't think it bothers the Gurkhas that these things exist because it's yeah. ultimately it, it's a it's a positive a positive reinforcement of their toughness. Yeah. If people think things about you. If people think you know that you, that you might put you know that, that certain troops might sculpt the enemy, or they might yes. that they all. That these things always had there's a basis of kind of semi-truth to them maybe but they all they all have a life of their own because they're because they're ultimately positive for instilling fear which is a very interesting concept yeah well i think because i like going back to this this unit is the lineage for two countries of special forces they have a vested interest in, in propping this up right yeah. this is our forefathers you know we kind of want people to think your special forces are nuts and are going to do things to you why wouldn't you want that, right? And this is, you know, especially in Canada. I mean, it's it's a very small group that pay attention to this stuff. But you know, like forces like is way out of scope now. But like GTF two, no one has any idea what those guys even do. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's no, point. definitely. But like, well, you know, the what I mean? last question before we leave yeah. things off is um is about the Johnson light machine gun. Um, and when that came up, I did some. You you may know yeah. the answer anyway. But yeah, there are. A higher number than average yeah. number of photos of four guys in the force with Johnson light machine guns. Yeah. They had, they were given one uh, hundred and fifty other in nineteen forty three. Yeah, um, so they do exist, but it's do, alongside it M1 Garands and third yeah. Brownings and everything not, else. It, again, I don't know the numbers. Uh, it's not included in the word diaries, but it, it is mentioned frequently because I remember that was brought up. I think for the, the Alex's show uh, was the Johnson again. So I just you know back in my head I kept reading it through because what i was literally trying to do is see if they had like a i don't know a guideline to patrolling or to raid right. right like sometimes you would find in the first world war like take all that experience of three years of trench raids and put it into almost doctrine quote unquote so i was looking to see if anything like that existed N not really uh it's mostly just syllabi just like every other war diary on the face of the planet um but the johnson comes up actually quite frequently but no it's not it's not the primary weapon by any means um, the training is is uh, mostly with the the what you would expect uh, M ones, uh, BAR, all that kind of stuff. It's 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 yeah, your yeah. typical American squad level. Small it, it's just that the, the, the most of the articles going down another rabbit hole. The most of the articles about the Johnson online are by rifle magazines and weapons experts who have obviously scoured the photos as they would to find yep. the cooler stuff popping up in photos because a photo of a guy in the force with an M1 Garand doesn't 
That's well, it's boring. The story. Yeah, it's boring. So, Nobody cares. So there are more photos of guys with Johnsons around, but for the reason that people have been specifically looking for them, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, you know, yeah. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't have noticed otherwise because I mean, I'm as you know, I'm not really into the whole rivet counting and kit and all that stuff. It's not really what I do. Uh, I do try to do higher level and you know personal experiences, but I, I, it just I only looked at it, only thought about yeah. it because it was mentioned in the show, and I was trying to find you know, what that training looked like after Kiska, especially because everyone wants to talk about the jump training and, you know, running around, you know, Montana, <laughs> but nobody wants to talk about what they're doing in, in, uh, in Vermont or, you know, what's going on after Kiska is a big, you know, letdown more or less. Um, mm. It's, it's, well, I think it's, that brings us back to the, to, to the starting point is that a unit such as this has had a lot written about them but the focus has been on certain aspects at the at possibly to the the loss of the others you know the yep. the, the exciting things the unique things they say the training in montana and the, the movie doesn't help although i in a guilty pleasure kind of way i kind of enjoy the movie for like a switch off eat chocolate what oh yeah kind of film but um I'll, I'll watch that scene of the canadians coming in for fun sometimes just because the other thing about the um when the canadians arrive at the camp yep. is the guys at the back, I think, are just anybody they picked because they're not in step, and that really annoys me because the Canadians <laughs> are shown to be the, the 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 proper military guys, whereas Americans are just hoodlums and, and criminals yeah. and stuff. If you look at the back of the column, the Canadians, they're all out of step. So clearly, they just that they just got anybody in, and uh, there's pipers and and drum uh, and, yep. and and what have you at the front, but the back is just a rabble of people wearing wearing beige, and they're all out of step. I, once I noticed that, I couldn't unnotice it again. Yeah, that's not the look uh, I find in that stuff. But right. yeah, I mean, it's the movie has obviously had some impact. Well, I was gonna we can end on this maybe because this might be a little bit not actually controversial. I think we need another book, but I think we need it done very differently. <laughs> well, Soul David is pretty good. Soul David did the yeah. Four um yeah. it, it's it's but it's sort of for it's it's a it's telling treading the train same ground in some ways of the training and the elite but the, i don't think anyone's looked at them but what we need is a a, a book a decent book about how these forces were deployed in world war ii and yeah. you know like the 101st on the island yeah. in 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 holland and the british airborne in north africa for example and merrill's marauders and the chindits exactly. and look at all take 10 units and say Admit that the idea was often really good. Admit that coming out of it is a fantastic reputation, but but possibly change the fact that they may not have been used as effectively as they could have been, albeit, as you said earlier, with the benefit of hindsight. Well, exactly. I mean, maybe, yeah, I'm an academic nerd here, but maybe not even a book, maybe a dissertation looking at exactly yeah, that. Yeah, dissertation. How, Jeff, yeah, you can mention that. It would have yeah. to be because well, where else could you do that and being able to do so without you know having to worry about selling books that's a good idea well we'll leave it there brad um as if you're finding this channel for for the first time folks welcome aboard and don't forget to subscribe and like and share what we're doing and leave a comment and branch out of course to brad's channel and have a look and uh, leave some comments there as well because we're moving together side by side we've been doing this some time now we have lots of heart to heart conversations about <laughs> why are we not getting millions of views but, you know we're plugging away we're doing well, our bits. Up, us. Yes. brad it's been great talking to you cheers everybody tomorrow my show is earlier it's three o'clock uk time peter hart is coming on to talk about the infantry in another part of italy but kind of going on concurrently with the nzo campaign as you know peter hart is always a hoot heart the hoot um i'll see you all then tomorrow cheers everybody bye